of the day, the Committee on Health, Land, Justice, and Culture is now called to order. Today is Tuesday, October 19th, 2021, and the time is 1.01 p.m. Notices for this virtual confirmation hearing were disseminated via email to all senators and main media broadcasting outlets and also published in the Guam Daily Post on Tuesday, October 12th, and again on Friday, October 15, 2021. The host of this hearing will mute all Zoom participants until called upon by the chair. Individuals testifying shall first be recognized by the chair before speaking and begin by stating their name for record keeping purposes. We only have one agenda item today and that is the confirmation or the appointment of David Herrera to serve as a member of the Chamorro Land Trust Commission for a term length of three years from April 11, 2019 to April 10, 2022 to fill the unexpired term of Joseph Cruz. I'd like to thank my colleague, Senator Tello Taitigui, for joining me today. Jesus Masi, Senator. And I want to thank you, Mr. Herrera, for being willing to accept this appointment to serve as a trustee of the Chamorro Land Trust Commission. And we're going to, uh, right before, I'm going to just give a little short background on the Chamorro Land Trust uh, before we hear from uh, those who are here to testify. The late Senator Paul Berdalia was the author of the Chamorro Land Trust Commission Act the Chamorro Land Trust Act. He had the vision and the fortitude and political will to get this passed 45 years ago in 1975. The act was passed unanimously by the 12th Guam legislature. After passage and for about 20 years, no governor, no governor would implement the act until the Inashon Chamorro under the leadership of Defunto Senator Angel Santos and Defunto Magalahi Ed Beneventi and their wives and many others, including I think Mr. David Herrera, who's here today, led an education and advocacy campaign urging the governor at that time to implement the trust. The governor refused to implement and a suit was filed by attorneys Mike Phillips, Mike Verdalio and myself at that time. This was a pro bono lawsuit without fees on behalf of Angel Santos and the Nashon Chamorro to compel implementation of the act. The AG at that time had argued that the trust was unconstitutional. A hearing on the lawsuit was held while hundreds led a protest and camp out on the grounds of Adeloupe. A decision was made in 1992 by then Judge Benjamin Cruz that the law was valid and ordered the governor to implement the act and appoint the first commissioners. Several years later in 1995, when Angel Santos was a Senator, he introduced the rules and regulations for the trust, which were slightly different than what the commissioners had originally written and controversial at that time. Again, he led hundreds in appearing before the legislature to urge lawmakers to adopt the rules, which they eventually did. With a few amendments over these years, the rules continue today. The Chamorro Land Trust Commission is responsible for the disposition of Chamorro homelands pursuant to mandates to advance the social, cultural, and economic development and well-being of the Chamorro people by way of residential, agricultural, and commercial land distribution and economic assistance programs. It is the commission's mission to carry out any activities necessary to inform and assist in obtaining maximum utilization of lands, including development of lands for their highest and best use in all phases of residential and agricultural leasing and commercial licensing. The commission's primary duty is to award leases to qualified beneficiaries for residential or agricultural uses and all leases and the processes towards awarding leases shall follow applicable laws. We have a... Um, many um, important people here to testify. So without further ado, I'm going to um, please invite uh, former Congressman Robert Underwood to testify. Congressman Underwood. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. No, Madam Speaker, uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to uh, uh, give my oral testimony on behalf of uh, David Herrera for this very important position as commissioner of the Chamorro Land Trust uh, Commission. Uh, you know, uh, in public service, um, uh, public service is, uh, always has many uh, pushes and pulls to it. And uh, one of them, of course, is that you have a high level of commitment. But commitment without competence is, uh, uh, doesn't mean anything. 
And then if you have somebody who's committed and then who has competence to do it, it's still missing one more uh, key element, I think, and that is a kind of a, an ethical and fair uh, outlook. And when, I, when you think about somebody uh, that you want to trust with something, David Herrera comes to my mind uh, almost instantly. I've known him for many years. So if uh, someone said to me, you know, I'm going to give you $100,000, Robert, and uh, I want you to name one person who will hold on to it for you and not spend it, I'm thinking David Herrera would be my man. That's how much I trust this man. He is ethical. He is fair. And, uh, and then when you match the, the, uh, the fervor with which he attends to all of his dealings, particularly in reference to uh, issues concerning the Chamorro people, and in this particular instance, the land trust, well, Madam Speaker, you've done uh, uh, him a great service by pointing out his own level of commitment uh, to the struggle uh, for the creation of the Chamorro Land Trust Commission, uh, not just by the originator, uh, Senator Paul Bordalio, but of course, uh, Senator uh, Angel Santos and uh, Nashon Chamorro. So that, that fervor is there. And then, of course, is he, does he know what he's talking about? Can he do this? Well, he has the experience to do this. He actually worked in, uh, uh, with the Department of Land Management as a special counselor for exactly these issues. So I think uh, before, uh, the, before the, uh, the, the people of Guam and before the representatives of the people of Guam in the Guam legislature, you have uh, the elements of excellent uh, public service uh, in the form of David Herrera, a man whose uh, 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 ethical demeanor uh, really reflects the best amongst us, his commitment to issues of uh, empowering the Chamorro people is clearly there. And of course, he's competent. So if you have someone who, who is knowledgeable and who is, who is courageous and, uh, and, and who's ethical, uh, then you have uh, the makings of a great public servant. So I heartily endorse uh, David uh, Herrera for this position. I wish him well, and I feel so much better that he would be on this commission. If only he could serve on two or three other commissions as well. And so I want to thank you for this opportunity. Sidus Masi. Sidus Masi, Dr. Underwood, Congressman. Very happy to hear your testimony. When I recognize the mayor, Kevin Susuiko, our agate mayor. Mayor. Hi, Buenos and Sidus Masi, Talu, Speaker, Madam Speaker, uh, for allowing me to come on to testify on behalf of uh, Mr. David Herrera. And for the record, um, my name is uh, Kevin Susuiko, the mayor of Bogget. I wish I would have went before Doc because Doc summed everything up, uh, you know, pretty much. I, I don't know, like, uh, Uncle John, what more you're going to say after Dr. Underwood. But, um, you know, I've known uh, Mr. Herrera all my life, being from, you know, the village of Hoggett. And uh, he's been a great role model, even uh, for me, even, you know, up until today. Um, he continues to to give the historical backgrounds of, of the different lands, not only within the municipality, but even for lands that, uh, you know, um, that uh, we need to know of, you know, that uh, maybe is important to one of our constituents that are down here that has questions. He's always a phone call away. And so, you know, when he called me to tell me that he was being appointed and, um, you know, if I could come on and, and speak on his behalf, um, I think of no greater person to, to take this uh, important role. And I remember growing up, I remember during the, uh, the time of, uh, of Defuntu, uh, Senator Angel Sablan, uh, you know, my mom was, was, was one of them that uh, used to go around with, with Mr. Herrera and, and um, you know, say what's right. You know, it's for the people. And so, um, you know, to add on to, to Dr. Underwood, uh, his uh, speech, I just echo uh, all the sentiments that he has. And I, I'm, you know, I fully support the appointment of, of uh, Mr. Herrera, uh, to most especially to, to, uh, to the board uh, for Tomorrow Land Trust. I, I could not think of any other person that uh, could sit on this board to, to really, um, get the people, most especially the, the Native people, um, what is due to them. So um, 
I, I hope it's a congratulations. It's not too early, but Suzu's Masi Talu, I won't take too much time, but Suzu's Masi for having me on um, to to just give my my uh, my thoughts on Mr. Herrera. Suzu's Masi Mayo. Um, we'll now hear from the executive director of the Guam Ancestral Lands Commission, Director Birch. Well, for today, uh, Madam Speaker, and I don't know how I can top the two earlier speakers. They're my friend and my nephew, uh, of course, Congressman uh, Underwood, my nephew, uh, Mayor Kevin Suiko of Agate. Uh, it seems like Dave has a similar round of circles that I have. So I also like to thank uh, the other senators here for uh, being here, uh, Senator Brown and Senator Tidegui and, uh, and uh, Chairman uh, Rages. And of course, my very good friend of 45 years or more actually, David Herrera. So I thank you again for this opportunity. My name is John Birch, the, for the record, Executive Director of uh, Guam Ancestral Lands Commission. Um, and I thank you all for this opportunity to testify in support of the governor's nomination of Mr. David Babalta Herrera to serve as a member of the Chamorro Land Trust Commission Board of Commissioners. I've known Dave for over 45 years and I've always known him to be a highly motivated person who has always taken his role seriously and is passionate about his results. Uh, he's a natural leader as the others before me had said, who has a, a very effective personal style that motivates others to produce the, be the best results possible. Of course, this is demonstrated by his work with the late Senator Angel L.G. Santos and his membership with Nation Tomorrow, and also by his hard work, which resolved the issue of several landlocked families in the village of Agate. And of course, his volunteer work that he's done in his ministry with his church that took him into the prison and other areas that many of us uh, do not, well, would hesitate to enter. Um, so I have no doubt that with the consent of the, the Guam legislature, Dave will help the Chamorro Land Trust Commission preserve the land restoration and justice mission of the Chamorro Land Trust in order to rectify the unjust taking of Chamorro homelands. Dave's acceptance of this nomination is testimony to his commitment to service and to his understanding of the great responsibility this position requires. So I strongly endorse his uh, nomination and appointment to this position. And I thank you for allowing me this opportunity uh, to testify in support of it. Thank you, Suzus Maasi. Suzus Maasi, Director Birch. We'll now hear from, oh, I'd like to recognize the presence of uh, Senator Joanne Brown, Suzus Maasi Senator, for joining us this morning. Uh, and now we'll hear from uh, the CLTC Chairperson, Mr. John Regis. Hi, Buenos and Hafede. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for the opportunity, um, Madam Chair, and for the members of the Committee on Health, Land, Justice, and Culture. Good afternoon, Senator Brown and Senator Tidegui. Um, Thank you for the opportunity again today. Uh, for the record, my name is John Regis, Jr. I'm the Chairman for the Chamorro Land Trust Commission. Um, and I'm here to participate in Mr. Herrera's appointment uh, by the Governor uh, to serve as the ASA Commissioner of the Chamorro Land Trust Commission. Um, I don't know him as long as everybody else, but uh, in my initial introduction with Mr. Herrera, uh, right out of the gates, uh, he shared his knowledge of the inception and history on, and his involvement on the commission, um, his passion for helping people, and his drive to do what is right. Um, his experience in the private and public sectors uh, would definitely be beneficial as a member of the commission. Um, his work, as you all have mentioned, with uh, Difundo, Anget, <coughs> Difundo Anget Santos and with the CLTC when it was under the Department of Land Management in the 90s, uh, brings the, the history and the wealth of history uh, to the commission. Um, and along with his work uh, with the residents of Hoggett and the Arendu and the Land for the Landless Issues, um, and working alongside the branches of government to pursue what is right during those times. Uh, I'm excited to continue to fill the vacancies of the commission as we diligently work on finalizing our um, four-year strategic plan, executing on that plan, providing affordable housing options for our constituents and increasing the land registrations and surveys uh, so we can pump out more leases in the very, very near future. Uh, so again, there's obviously now a lack of work for the, for, for the Tremoral Land Trust Commission and I humbly ask uh, the committees and the committee members and senators support for Mr. Herrera's nomination to to serve on the commission 
And of course, and I thank him for accepting uh, the nomination. Sidus Masi. Sidus Masi, Chairperson Regis. I'm going to read a very quick letter by Jose Ujoa Garrido that we also received uh, for today's hearing. Half a day, Madam Speaker, I hereby submit my letter of support for the appointment of Mr. David B. Herrera to be a member of the Chamorro Land Trust Commission. Mr. Herrera would be a strong addition to the commission as a man of integrity and fairness. He is well versed of the reason the Chamorro Land Trust was established and knowledgeable of the issues confronting our lands and natural resources. He is a fighter for our Chamorro land rights and knows well the history of taking of our lands and the injustices that our people face because of it. I know David for many years. He is a Chamorro family man from the village of Hoggett, an individual who is fair and knows what Chamorro lands mean to our people. He will be a great asset to the the Chamorro Land Trust Commission and will serve it well with honor. Don Cruz Nasizuas Masi, Jose Ujoa Garrido, World War II Chamorro survivor, Chamorro human rights and land rights advocate, Taltotano Guahan. All right, thank you again, Mr. Herrera. Uh, we will now hear from you if you would uh, like to present any testimony. Sound check. Is the Don Cluna Sidus Masi? He na onu si the bit about the Herrera. How to is from Hogadzu. When I say, Madam uh, Speaker Terlahi, and uh, Senator Joanne Brown, and Senator Telotai Nasidus Masi. Now, no is who ni estina put you not, but by who this Igu, the senior hat waha Sansa. Then saku para bayu membru gi komision i inangokun tanut samoru. Thank you all for giving me this opportunity to testify and be considered to be a member of the Chamorro Land Trust Commission. I also thank all of the distinguished community. Leaders that for this elite body to provide this land trust, my family and I are sincerely humbled and blessed. We are gathered here today in 2021 essentially to resolve the endemic land grab issues that occurred and are documented since 1898 to 1968. We have been exploited in the past, and if we are not cognizant, we will be exploited again. And today in the 21st century, if we do not stand firm to be conscious this of the unseen forces, perpetrated, propagated, and motivated forces, motivated for regional and global military power. The endemic land grab accelerated during the control by the U.S. naval government in 1898 and up until today with tens and thousands of square meters being swindled in the 1990s up until now and in the 21st century. In 1975, the Guam legislature passed the Chamorro Land Trust now known as you mentioned, 12 to 26, violated the Fair Housing Act of 1968. And the Chamorro Land Trust Act is a discriminatory race based program. When in the U.S. District Court and was ordered the United States motion seeking document. The United States believes that it is in the public's best interest that this civil action created the settlement agreement between the United States and Guam on October 9th by COR and act to add a new chapter 75 Alpha Title 21 relative to preserve the land restoration and 
justice mission of the Timor Land Trust and was introduced by then Senator Teresa Lahi, who is now a referring speaker for the 36th Guam Legislature and was then signed into law on December 10, 2020 by Governor Luyong Reu, which is now public law 35 on one and two. In closing, the land trust needs adequate funds to accomplish parts of its, its mission. Last year, the general known as the resolution of the 2020 that through to principles are a testament to the past 45 years of trials and tribulation. And it is to provide guidance that past errors and injustices are not made in the future. I focus on all 17, but number 13 is very relevant to the situation that we are facing today and for the past 45 years. It's a, an effort to accelerate reaching our goals and objectives within a five to 10 year period. We need to construct infrastructure requirements in the South Central and nor Northern properties that were formerly under the Land for the Land Use Program. Principle number 13 states that, quote, the commission's fiduciary duty must also include working with the legislature to finally fully fund the operations and special funds of the whole land trust, including but not limited to the installation of infrastructure on Chamor land trust properties. And both. On that note, Madam Chair, may I respectfully request to open the link on EIS to view Chamor land trust track number 9210. That is located on the east portion of the uh, entrance to Anderson Air Force Base. And if we can zoom in to see the division of the lot, I would like to point out a little bit more. There we go. On this scene, if we look at the uh, Route 1, these lots from Block 1, from Block 1 to 20, you can almost count that there's about maybe a hundred plus lots here. The point that I'm trying to mention here about getting funds for the property, for the road is that a lot of these lots are close to the infrastructure. They're close to Route 1 that has the water power sewer. And if you notice the colors, the dark green colors indicate that have been left idle. Lots that have light blue colors is the color of the rooftop. This was phase one of about approximately 400 lots. If you look at the ratio on this particular part, you, almost 50% to 60% is left vacant. And this is one of the uh, important issues that I was bringing up that if we do obligate the funds, Within five years, we can occupy all of the rest of the lots. Most of the lots already have uh, lessees that are permanently paying taxes, but are not occupying the lot for many, many reasons. But again, as I mentioned, if you look at Route 1, and you count how many lots that are just fronting Route 1, they are vacant. And ask the staff to go down now to track number 1022 to Isengsun and Swan Road. This is one of the 4,000, this is one track that is a total of about 4,000 lots that we uh, protested back in 95 to transfer this land for the land use lots back to the more land plots inventory. In the straight line going across, that is a Swan Road, not tw uh, Route 28. Here again, if you look at the light blue colors, these are homes. On the north side of Swamp Road, notice the light blue color on the indicates rooftop. If you look at the squares that are empty, and you know when 
Dr. Brown was mentioning about, uh, she was mentioning a lot about uh, roads going into properties that are occupied. By people, if you notice the dark white kind rights of way on this property. So these dark white colors that go into this particular thing, more problems instead of us trying to solve the issue between being the proper rights of way on the designated rights of way uh, area for the property. So, this is is again track 1022, almost 75% is unoccupied. Look at all the light blue colors and look at all the empty green squares with a unused idle property. This is part of the 4,000 lots. Thanks, Teresa even Agat. Look at all the end squares and uh, that would in a short summary on The uh, west side of the uh, Route 2, and then the property that we're looking at would be on the right side. And right there, very good. Uh, we can elevate our elevation just uh, maybe 100 foot up, and we can see a lot of square lots for track 319, a little bit more. Good, okay. Now, just observe the vegetation. The dark green vegetation <laughs> indicate uh, that's a creek, that's a river that goes out to the ocean next. The squares that you see on track 319 are unoccupied lots. There's a total of 211 lots here. If you count to 11, there may be maybe 30 homes that are up. So if we can go up a little bit uh, higher, T, maybe another click or two. If, uh, you, you can see those red color uh, versus the green. The red indicates uh, clay soil, which is a uh, hazard to soil erosion. And uh, the mayor would uh, testify that you know, one of the area where flooding occurs. This dark green uh, vegetation that you see, it's a creek. Uh, this is a, a, what they call it by, uh, it's a twin creek that leads uh, down to the marina. So observe the empty green lots. Now, Umang and uh, the uh, water power sewer, they're still within the vicinity, about 100 foot from the, these lots. Again, this is one of the reasons why that if we update funds to fix the uh, road here, the only difference between this solve configuration on the topography is that I get is uh, Kind of plagued with a the topography that's very undulating. In other words, the if you have uh, Mount Elephant up to Mount Lam Lam, and then if you go down to the sea level, when you look at this at an angle, whenever it rains, the mayor would testify that a flash flood here occurs really quick, and soil erosion is uh, 
accelerated. So again, if we have the right engineering uh, process here and get the proper road in and the proper drainage for the hydraulics, then we can occupy these lots. All these green lots are already assigned to uh, lessees. A lot of them are paying taxes up until today. But if you look at the configuration of the lot, this doesn't show our elevation, but we're basically uh, about maybe 100 to 200 feet from sea level. So, and then uh, lastly, we can head over to Lot 15, the uh, Guam Raceway Park, and that would conclude our uh, site. Remember, there's 4,000 Chamorro Land Trust lots that are uh, located in Edidu, down to Agat, Yumadek, Marisu, Talifoku, and uh, Inorahan. So the reason why we're asking, uh, I'm asking for us to view this a lot, uh, Route 15, is that if you look at the vegetation again, and then we look at where the raceway park, uh, this white coloration, as uh, you mentioned, I don't care about uh, mineral rights. So if we can go up a little bit here. Remember the Chamorro Land Trust uh, issued a lease to one of the uh, operators for the Guam Raceway Park. And then uh, a couple of more clicks so we can see the neighboring lot here is a Smith Bridge quarry, and then you have the raceway park. Now, keep an eye on this light uh, road. This is the raceway park, the quarter mile run. Then there's a road that leads north. It goes into either private lot or this is uh, on the left, a little bit more T. So, this trail here, when uh, we're reviewing your uh, December or January 25th hearing regarding, uh, okay, a little bit more. Uh, so we can see the quarry for Smith Ridge. This is North, you see that trail? Uh, I'm not sure. This light white coloring, indicates that the vegetation is gone. How deep is the topography on this one? I do not know right now, but just based on this photograph, you can tell that the vegetation is gone. And if you notice, if you look closely down here, uh, uh, those square appears to be equipment. But again, I cannot jump to the conclusion that it's being quarry uh, on the raceway park a little bit higher again. Yeah, you see the trail going to the right. It goes into, there's two or three lots and then it heads into the uh, quarry for uh, that company. I was just drag it a little bit, there you go, correct. Yeah, a little bit more. We are looking at the, uh, this is heading north, north, north. Look at the green vegetation and then it leads into, okay, go ahead and pull it a little bit down again. Yeah, I see it's loading. So again, Route 15 is on the left. If you pass through Route 15, you would have no idea what's going on behind the uh, vegetation. Here, you, there, you can still see the uh, reddish white color. Okay, we're almost there. I know it's loading again, so. Okay, good. Notice that trail. Um, again, I will not jump from the trail is, but if it's a trail for motorcycle or a trail for off-road, uh, on a planted, kind of coral, this kind of coral, it's called the planted coral or it's a high grade coral. I don't think a motorbike would do this kind of trail. A little bit more, yeah, 
And here you have lot good 7164. There's a rights of way. Then it leads me to lot 71. Where that's three. And then your side. So again, I uh, good. Jarissa, can you follow that trail to the end and let's see where it, it, it exits? It bifurcates right up, up on top and uh, right there at the Y. Look at the homes on the left, right? Uh, on the left of this. Uh, last year, I uh, we I, I went to one of the homes here. We killed uh, one cow and we pinned it over here at this uh, area. And while we were cleaning the that we were slaughtering uh, during the whole day, the dogs were really getting to the homes and the you know the barbecue area that we were at. And I had no idea what this. Uh, you know what the problem was, but you look at the green vegetation next to this home. No. So just when I was watching the uh, hearing that you guys had uh, for July uh, for June 25th, uh, it kind of dawned on me to find out, you know, about mineral rights. And just by viewing this, this I'm not sure how current this photo is, but again, we can confirm if. Do site visit or the raceway park is on the more land. So again, thank you again, Madam Chair, and all the committee members and family and that would be my Thank you very much, Mr. Herrera. And I actually uh, really appreciate it. The the extra time and effort you put into showing those lots and the potential for those lots and of course the concerns uh, involving those lots. All right, the uh, executive director for the Chamorro Land Trust was on, I don't see her right now, so she must be having uh, some difficulties, technical difficulties. Uh, in the interim, we received a letter from Mr. Selva Balta, who is the executive mm -hmm. director of Guam Regional Transit Authority. I'd like to read it, it's very short, uh, it's in support of your nomination. It says, half a day, Madam Speaker and Honorable Senators. My name is Celestine C. Babauta from the village of Abed. I would like to convey my sincere appreciation for allowing me to testify in support of Mr. David B. Herrera's nomination as member of the Tomorrowland Trust Commission. Mr. Herrera and I, along with our siblings, were raised in Uman, where we had to work hard for our livelihood. I can vividly recall how he had to plant how we had to plant bananas, beans, taro, doggo, eggplants, and much more. At the same time, we were raising chickens, pigs, cows, had a carabao, fishing, hunting, and more. All of these we had to do to survive. We did not have the comforts of hot water to shower, flushing toilets, air condition, and television. It was through our upbringing that our values in life were shaped. We were poor, so we had so we have a clear picture of those in our island who are without a piece of land to establish themselves and provide for a decent life. Like Mr. Herrera and me, all they need is land to plant and grow vegetables and raise the animals and be self-sustaining. David, with his experience in property ownership and the desire to help the most vulnerable people in Guam, I firmly believe that he will ensure that lands under the Chamorro Land Trust are effectively managed. I'm quite sure that he will ensure that the statute that governs the Chamorro Land Trust will be adhered to and followed. Madam Speaker and Honorable Senators, I am humbly requesting your support to confirm David B. Herrera as member of the Chamorro Land Trust Commission. Sidzuos Maasi, sinceramente, Sel Babalta. All right. Um, so Mr. Herrera, we're now going to allow the senators to to ask you some questions or ask any of the panel members questions. And I wanna thank all of them for their testimony. That's been very helpful to get a full picture of this uh, person who's been nominated and uh, their full potential and their character and other 
factors that are relevant uh, in his abilities to do the work and his um, compassion in the work that he's going to do. So I have a few quick questions and um, wanted to know, we talked about fully funding the Tomorrowland Trust Commission. It's uh, the attitude of many of the senators that the, the land trust commission should be self-sustaining because it's, it has the ability to lease, uh, issue commercial leases and licenses. And um, I really, you know, urge the chairman of uh, appropriations this year to add a little bit extra funding. Their funding is really small and to add a little bit extra so that they could hire additional employees this fiscal year 2022 so that uh, they could get up to speed and, and um, do the work that it ha the commission has to do and that it's behind in and to make sure that uh, if it needed additional employees to ensure that those commercial leases were actually you know, paying, that the commercial leases were doing what they're supposed to be doing for the trust as well, that, that the trust had that type of staff. What other ideas are you thinking about for this funding uh, that you talked about for the trust? Oh, uh, you ask. Uh, let me see if I hear the question correctly. You were kind of asking me how would I be able, to, or what's my idea to create revenue? Yes. Well, you said that we need to work with the legislature to oh, fully yes. fund, to fully fund, right? So, do you believe? Um, yeah. What What are your ideas that uh, the, the legislature should just come up with more money on for the trust operation? Well, well, I. Uh, Yes and no, because you know the uh, uh, general funds, right? For the line agencies, uh, they're very limited. And with the Tomorrow Land Trust, the revenue for the land trust a uh, couple of years ago was only uh, seven hundred and sixty-three thousand mm -hmm. dollars. The expense is about five hundred and eighty. So that it's almost like you're breaking even. Your profit margin is very slim. So. I was listening to a lot of the ideas that you had with the uh, submerged land, with uh, uh, the cable companies. That's just one source. Now, I understand that the lease was raised from, I guess, a couple of thousands per year to a hundred thousand bucks per wire, per license. And if there are six cables, that's 600K. Uh, that's good, but it's still not enough. I mean, but you know, we don't want to, we don't want to price ourselves out of the business because we have other neighbors that may be able to take in the cable and boost that cable. Uh, right. Uh, I was more getting into uh, charging the cable company by terabytes or megabytes or gigabytes. In that kind of cash flow, the more the more flow, the you know we get a ratio on uh, some of the flow. But that's just one. Uh, we have other properties. A lot of the ideas come from you know what are we going to do with the uh, Ipo Hospital Point? We can say we can use that for tourism, but we know that tourism is not bulletproof. We had a crash for almost two years. I do a lot of uh, businesses with uh, the, the tour company down in Tumon and it went down from, but that's that uh, fact. Uh, some of the ideas that I have released like one power Authority, Warm Water Works, uh, an agency for requesting about 24,000 acres. The senator ended up kind of allotting them about 1,400 acres. What's the thought on that? If the power agency is creating that amount of cash flow, I think us could also get a, a, a fraction of that kind of Gas generation. That's just a thought, but we have to engineer the legislation to be 
you know, get a comfortable the water. There's a lot of water, so and we generate cash flow from the water that's being extracted, treated, and then sold to the general public. And we know that the water cost keeps going up. The water, the power cost keeps going up. What's the benefit for the trust that owns the real estate, the water? It's just one, two or three ideas. So go ahead. I appreciate those, Mr. Herrera. And I know uh, you're just getting started. And um, But you've been thinking about this for many, many years. And I appreciate that. I think that's evident. And I, I, I have encourage the trust and I'm looking forward to your uh, your help in this regard for, you know, we, we've got to think out of the box when it comes to this. We can't do what we've been doing in the past. We need to do different. We need to do much, much better. We need to, if we're gonna lease a piece of property because we're not going to use that for residential property, that's taking it off of the, you know, residential lease possibility. And I think that's, that's huge. And if we're going to remove it from residential leasing, then it very much better bring in some good money for this trust and uh, make it worthwhile, right? Otherwise, we should be allowing homes to be built on all of these properties. Uh, so I, I look forward to your ideas and work, and your work with the board uh, in that regard. Yeah. I, um, we talked about specific tracks. I think I'm going to skip my questions on those and talk to you a little bit about those offline later. Um, I'm glad that you read the resolution number 2020-02. I've been asking uh, most of the nominees who come through my committee for confirmation whether they've um, read this resolution. This resolution was passed in 2020 or at the very end of 2019. It was uh, on the last day of the former chairwoman, Pika Ferrin's uh, uh, term on the board. And what it did was try to summarize, it's the declaration of the principles of the Chamorro Land Trust Commission relative to its authority and responsibilities. And they tried to summarize what they were authorized to do by law and what they had also learned over the years and wanted to make sure future board members also could benefit from you know, past experience and so that we don't um, make the same errors again. And a lot of it has to do with priorities, right? And having learned, uh, you know, and I, I'm glad you pointed out that one about fully funding. And I also pointed one earlier about the, the primary duty is to award residential or agricultural use leases. And uh, to make sure that our processes for those leases, it's a very basic, but it's still you know having some problems that, that those, uh, as, as the chairman said, that those processes are, are, are made, um, you know, as perfect as they can be so that we don't, the trust does not get accused anymore of favoritism. It doesn't get accused of bypassing the law, all of that. So we're really, uh, you know, hopeful with, with all of you on the board. Uh, there's a question here I'd like to ask you. Um, you know, being, you're appointed by the governor, you're confirmed by the legislature. So there's, you know, a little bit of politics involved there. But you know, we want this trust to serve the people of Guam, right? It has a, a mission outside of politics. And I just wanted to get your thoughts on, um, you, know, I'm, you know, stepping up to the board. I'm very grateful to those who do this type of work because I don't think it's easy to balance you know, what everyone in the community wants to do when, especially when they're controversial or when you know, we don't have a unison of uh, what, what we think should happen on these lands. Um, recently, the Chamorro Land Trust had to um, make a finding about its administrative director being not suited for the position. And this was, of course, controversial. It's not easy to do that type of thing. It's uh, very difficult, in fact, because we're all friends, right? And we all, um, these are all nominations that, uh, you know, from the same person. And so I just want to get your thoughts on the board's ability to act independent of the legislature when it has to, independent of the governor when it has to, in order to do for the people of Guam what it's supposed to do. Okay, and the question. Your thoughts on, are you think you're able to do that? To act independently? 
about politics in the is that the question? Wait. Yes. Yes. Uh, would you be able? Hear. Yeah. Uh, would you be able to act independently on this as a commissioner, independent of politics? Uh, yes, of course, because the mandate is very clear in the uh, how it was written, and if we stay within that guideline, then there's no uh, room for uh, straying away from the mandate. All right. Thank you, Mr. Herrera. I'm going to open it up now for Senator Telotai to please. Senator. Sujus Masi, Madam uh, Speaker and Madam Chair, for the opportunity. Um, half a day, Mr. Herrera. Half a day. Todo malik. Malik, malik, zagu. Didi. Didi. Well, you know, I, I just want to say I'm very impressed first by those who came on uh, to testify on your behalf, you know, that it's very impressive. And even by Celestine Babauta um, and uh, what they had, the great things they had to say about about you. And uh, though I wish I had gotten to know you sooner, too, uh, because of all the good work you've done. I've looked at your history, um, even working at the legislature. Uh, you've been in this position or in this place uh, to see what the process is and usually what senators require, uh, especially working under, you know, the, the late Senator um, Santos. Mm -hmm. um, as well as your work at land management, um, I think you, you came aboard uh, at the tail end of my mom and my dad's uh, term at land, land management, but uh, knowing mm -hmm. you have a background in, in that perspective is very good. Um, it'll add to, to what you are now seeking to be appointed to, which is very, it can be very controversial, uh, very sensitive um, area. And I'm very happy that uh, you're not going to put politics first before the responsibility of the people of Guam. You know, we in, put our, pro, our lands, historical lands in your trust you know, uh, hence the word trust, you know, to, to ensure that it goes and fairly goes to those who really need the property and who would like to, you know, farm the lands, et cetera. And I do um, had some, I did have some questions uh, regarding um, finances, but, you know, the speaker asked a great question and um, a lot of the questions she asked, I, I had on my list, but I do want to ask you with regards to, um, do you think that there is a sufficient uh, enough or collaboration to support uh, the trust between the other agencies like ancestral and um, land management? Is there a significant collaboration currently? Uh, uh, yes, especially now with the uh, new 35112, the new law that requires the applicants to be tied into a, an ancestral uh, genealogy to be qualified for the uh, property. So that kind of, we need the ancestral lands data base to cross-reference with the applicants now, including the first 10,000 applicants that uh, came in on December of 95. Mm -hmm. So that would be uh, a critical database that we need, including the data from the the court mm -hmm. and also the uh, land management data. Okay. But yes, ancestral lands uh, database would be pretty good cool, this new uh, law. Okay, that's good to hear. And I hope that uh, that collaboration, um, you know, stays strong. Uh, sometimes when there's a disconnect, uh, that's when we fall short, you know, in, in transparency. So uh, I hope that stays into good form. <laughs> uh, yes. And, and I'm sure you're going to make that happen. You know, uh, the the information that you provided in your testimony, I was very impressed as well. You know, getting all that information and looking at the uh, documents that you provided, it's obvious that that you do know your stuff, and uh, it's comforting, very comforting to know. And because of your research, um, I was hoping that if you have an opportunity, or maybe you've already had that opportunity. You brought up earlier discussing the fiber optic cables. Um, that mm -hmm. was something that was very uh, dear to my heart, you know, and working hard to try and find a, an amount that uh, justifies. It's, it's, 
existence onto this island as it does in other jurisdictions other than Guam, that we don't get the short end of the stick. And I think uh, the legislation that just recently passed was it's pretty fair. It definitely was far cry from the original, uh, another bill that was passed, and I'm sorry, a contract that was signed in 2016, uh, which more land trust and another uh, cable company, mm -hmm. Guam, which was significantly lower, you know, per year. We're only talking about $5,000 per year, and that did not go into each fiber optic cable. It was just a lease. Um, however, if you have an opportunity, Mr. Herrera, I appreciate if you could review that contract, specifically mm -hmm. on page three, um, the compensation section, where after uh, five years, there is a reassessment and a calculations of the cost per year. And then there's one from in six years to 10 years, there's a reevaluation. And then from 11 years to 15, a reevaluation. But again, um, it's significantly low. And I'm, I hope that you can use your legal uh, side on this uh, department at Chamorro Land Trust to determine whether you have the authority to increase that amount. Uh, because it does say that it, it gives you, and, I, and I, I'll read it, the license fee shall be subject to escalation rate of 10% of each fifth year anniversary of the commencement date. However, an assessment of the fair market value shall be conducted prior to the end of the fifth year. So saying the fair market value, the bill that we recently passed now provides a precedence on the amount of, of what is considered the fair market value, I would, I would assume. And a, a lot of research was put into that bill. So I hope you um, have an opportunity to read again the, the contract uh, between uh, Chamorro Land Trust and the cable company on this island. So I thank you again for wanting to serve the people of Guam and uh, appreciate uh, all your dedication and hard work. And I'd like to thank your family too for allowing you to you know, decide to add something else to your plate. <laughs> so again, and to those, so who, those who came to testify, my, my nephew, the mayor of Hoggett, mm. thank you so much for your testimony as well. And John and, and, and uh, the chairman, Sidusmasi. Is this Mossy Senator? Senator Brown, you are recognized. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, certainly appreciate uh, Mr. Herrera stepping up to the plate uh, to want to serve in the Tomorrow Land Trust Commission. But I did want to ask, because it's kind of unusual, are, are you still currently employed with the Guam International Airport Authority? Yes. In a classified or unclassified? Uh, yes. Uh, Are yes, you in a classified uh, or unclassified position? I am classified. Uh, yeah, I'm asking because it's kind of unusual to have classified employees uh, uh, currently serving class appointed. Classified. Type of How are you going to divide your, your duties uh, if these meetings are during working hours? Because again, it's unusual. Normally we have, if you have individuals that are appointed in the government to these positions that are currently working in the government, they're unclassified employees. So I, I'm just a little curious because it's unusual for these type of positions to be occupied, uh, to sit on these boards, to be a classified service. I see. Yeah, that kind of crossed my thoughts uh, many years before that if you're a classified employee and, uh, you know, you get into the board or uh, in a director position, I guess, you know, it's like bubble uh, but, uh I guess you're trying to see if there's a conflict of interest between being a Oh, well, I don't know if it's so much conflict of interest, but if these meetings are occurring during working hours, how are you going to address your duties of your official job during working hours as a classified employee and then sit on a board of commission? Because most of the time, some, I see these meetings are actually happening during working hours. Oh, yes. Uh, so far, uh, you know, uh, every year I contribute a hundred hours of excess leave to employees that need uh, health uh, or sick leave. Ever since I worked for the government, I've been there already for about 10 years. So every year, honestly, I contribute about a hundred hours of excess leave. 
Uh, fortunately, I have not uh, experienced any medical uh, problems yet. And, uh, you know, because we earn sick leave and annual leave. So every, every year I accumulate over 300 some hours of annual leave. So, and a lot of times it's, uh, you know, the management will say, it's either you're going to use or lose uh, your leave and that's uh, you can check my record that uh, er every year ever since I've worked for the airport very rare do I take a day off or what the annual uh, excess leave requires that you either take it or lose it so I contribute it to uh, employees that need uh, medical leave just again last week or a couple of weeks ago I contributed to a cancer uh, patient a uh, hundred hours. So, with that excess hours, if there's a one day leave for a meeting, I can uh, use the leave to attend to the meeting. Uh, well, I, that. I, I, just, so I just want to make sure that there's there's no conflict during your your regular working hours. I see. Now, Gov Guam style is very laid back, and we let a lot of things go, but that doesn't set the best example. So that's the reason I'm asking with regards to that. The other thing okay. with your background, which I think is quite beneficial, Mr. Herrera, but but I'm also, as many of us are aware, there's been a lot of the unfortunate mis misuse and abuse of Chamorro Land Trust property. And I had the opportunity when I was working up at the University of Guam to work on an agreement with the Chamorro Land Trust, where we actually reviewed a number of the lease uh, agreements, particularly for uh, we started off with the agricultural lease program, and then that started to expand as well to look at the commercial lease program to find out at the time there were many commercial leases that were not up to date with regards to, you know, their, their obligation and their responsibility to be paying on those commercial leases. And unfortunately, with regards to the land lease, a substantial amount of non-compliance non-compliance, particularly with regards to agricultural leases that were originally intended and given to our people uh, you know, to address agricultural lease, if not just for subsistence, but if they wanted to farm for, you know, for their uh, income, to expand their income, certainly we were encouraging of that opportunity. Uh, I don't know that much has changed with the land trust. I think instead of moving forward, of course, looking at, at providing additional leases to our people is important. But I'm also concerned about the substantial abuse that has happened in the land trust. I'm concerned about even down to the degree we've seen where employees of the land trust themselves have benefited themselves and their families to make sure that they get property and prime property. You know, they're making sure they're getting the ocean view and the beach uh, property. And, and we know that's a total conflict. And as you're aware, you mentioned the number of 10,000 plus applicants since 1995, many who have yet to this day to see any opportunity for a land lease. And yet we have many also that have jumped in front of the line because of their political connections. Uh, to get land trust property. Some of them have been able to made to order. They literally can get their land trust adjacent to their family lands. And that kind of abuse that has occurred that is still to this day in place. So I would really want to know in, in your interest in wanting to serve and considering the, the background that you bring that I believe is very beneficial. I would like to know what would you and what are you going to do to help address those injustices? Because it's one thing we can talk about oppressors from the outside. We can talk about colonialism. We can talk about our history that has been unjust and unfair to our people. But what bothers me the most is when it's our own people, when it's our own people that are abusing uh, the resources that they, they have and the opportunity they have to have land trust property, when we know there are thousands of many others that probably would earnestly love to have this property to use for the intended purposes, but may never ever get a chance because at some point the land's gonna run out. At some point, it may be our great, great, great grandchildren as we continue to grow that may never ever have that opportunity. And I'm very offended when I see those that have been given this privilege of our own people that abuse that, especially because the land trust has such limited capability of doing enforcement and has done very little to consistently address enforcement to correct those issues so that we don't have the kind of abuse that is almost a standard. And I hate to say that, but you know, having sat for hours on days, on months and going through these land trust uh, leases, uh, you know, it's very disturbing when you do that. It, it, it's unsettling to me 
uh, and knowing that that's still in place, I hope moving forward that that you know that kind of nonsense stops. But there's many years of abuse that that has been left behind us uh, that needs to be corrected, so that we have collectively as a community a sense of confidence that you know the land is being used for its intended purpose. Because I think that's that's what the policy was set to do. That's what we concurred and determined should be the policy of our island with regard to land trust. I'm sorry to go on so long about this, but. It, it's just very disturbing to me when I see the abuse of these resources, especially when many that are deserving will never have the opportunity in their lifetime to even experience having land that they can say is something that they, they have and they can use either to have a residential home or of course, if it's agricultural, to be able to plant and be able to sustain their family or perhaps earn additional income. So I wanted to get your feedback with regards to that. Here's the feedback when I was uh, listening to the uh, presentation that you guys did back in June of 23rd with the uh, uh, chairperson. You were, uh, what really stuck to me is that when you mentioned that the, uh, a lot of the uh, applicants have a tailor made drive through kind of property, but then when you mentioned about a, a property owner or a, pro a lessee where we just when you see a road going through their property, and we're saying, how, how did that road go through there? So when you mentioned that on that last 23rd, I said, uh, you know, Senator Brown has a point. So let me just try to uh, do an aerial view of uh, these properties that have roads going perpendicular to the rights of way. And that's how I came up to go to Swamp Road to, uh, uh, was that the Anderson Air Force Base? Phase one, and sure enough, from the air, from the air you can you can see a lot. Uh, I'm a drone enthusiast, mm -hmm. but the Google Earth can also give you that kind of perspective from the air. So if you remember, we just viewed a uh, uh, swamp road, and if you look at all those roads that are going, uh, uh, you know, across, and then we're saying. Okay, that's, you know, it's very unorganized, right? And then it's very disturbing for a property owner, especially if they're just an old Tunuste or San Maria, mm -hmm. and you have a road coming through and uh, they have no recourse to correct that. That's one point. The other point that you were saying is that what about the abuses from the agriculture? Uh, yes, again, from the air with uh, the eco GIS aerial photo, and as you mentioned, sometimes it looks really good in the uh, computer when you look at the property lines and the aerial vegetation, it looks good. But when you get down to ground level and, and you start pulling the measuring tape and you say, something's not right. So uh, every time you bring up, uh, you know, things like that in the uh, re regarding the property, it really triggers my brain to say, you know, I think Senator Brown has a point here. So let me just do a photo check. So if you remember the uh, connection between the raceway park mm -hmm. and the that private company, and yes. I'm saying, you know, that, that artery doesn't look, it's not normal. And that's how I found that from uh, just listening to your June 25th oversight with the land trust. If you may recall that that was when this lady, I think Mrs. Petrus came in and said that she was now 67 years old with the 91 year old mom, went to line up in PD and her application is missing. I don't know mm -hmm. if you recall that on that hearing. I'm saying, oh, okay, did we digitize the, did we digitize the receipt of that person? Or apparently the, instructed her to go ahead and line up in, and do another applicant application, which is about $50. And to that particular family or that uh, client that came uh, in front of your committee at that day, I'm pretty sure 50 bucks, not, you know, to us maybe 50 bucks is just a fraction of the income that we earn a year, but to that family, Fifty bucks, a lot of books. So I can feel, I can feel your spirit. And do we want compliance? Of course. 
uh, when I look at the agriculture contracts that were done back in maybe the 60s, 70s, or 80s, some of the contracts for the agriculture goes up to 100 acres. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? 100 acres. I, I can use 100 acres. You can ask the mayor. I, I raise cattle. 100 acres is not enough for me if I'm going to raise the sufficient amount of cattle I want. 100 is action. So you can ask the mayor. Uh, I have what, uh, you know, uh, I raise cows and I give it out for those that want to start a subsistence kind of grazing. But again, back to the uh, situation that you're talking about where some of the properties up to 100 acres and, you know, if, if you do an aerial and check that 100 acre or a 50 acre or a 20 acre, only a fraction is being used. Now, are they bona fide farmers? I don't know, but we can check. Are they, uh, are you? The facts, but we have to get aerial views. No, what? Uh, I know uh, the questions you mentioned are. I know we're just having some technical difficulty, Mr. Herrera. I, I won't belabor it, but I definitely would like to see the Chamorro Land Trust be much more active with regards to enforcement and compliance and not allow these, these continued abuses of the land trust to slide because that's really what's happened, you know, since the implementation of the land trust. And that, that's almost been a standard and it's very bothersome. It's bothersome to me, and I think for most people, especially those that, again, as I mentioned, are never going to have the opportunity. And so when you see among our own people, those that abuse that, misuse the land or don't use it for its intended purpose or subleasing it for other interests that is unrelated to the purpose of why they were granted that land trust. It's different. If it's my own private property, as long as I'm operating within the confines of the law, then I guess I get to do what I want to with my land. But this land was set aside for a very specific purpose, a very clearly intended purpose. And, you know, it's not something that, you know, and I don't know why, why that is. I, I am bothered by it. And I, I just hate to see that practice continue. One other thing I also would like to see, and that's not been consistent in the history of the land trust, is requiring these lands to be properly surveyed and recorded. I've seen maps where surveys have been conducted for the land trust, but not properly completed or surveyed with regards to surveyors' ultimate responsibility in, in generating these maps. You have land that has been handed out to people that, you know, oh, go do your own survey. And then we end up finding out that there's disputes on boundaries because uh, my surveyor and your surveyor don't have the same meets and bounds that they're supposed to have. And then that creates a lot of problems and a lot of conflict. Or what someone thought was their, their lot, they end up finding out, oh, no, that's not the area you were assigned, especially when they're already invested in that property. So I think, you know, before the land trust ever issues any more lots, they also need to make sure that these lots are properly surveyed. Uh, and properly recorded so that there's no issue there with regards to, you know, these things keep coming back to haunt us. Uh, and it really shouldn't have been the case. I mean, we're, we want to hand out the land, yes, but let's do it in the right way. Let's ensure that there's conformance with regards to land use. And if people don't comply, I don't know why this is so complicated. You give them the opportunity to correct. And if they don't, then there's other tomorrow standing in line that would love the opportunity. And I, I think we're being unfair to them. We're being incredibly unfair to our future generations by setting these type of bad examples. And then, you know, we turn the blind eye and we just let it happen. Uh, and I think those that are in responsibility need to step up to the plate and start doing what they're supposed to do in the interest of the public. So, you know, certainly from your presentation, I, I'm hopeful, I, I hear it in your voice also that this is very important to you personally. Uh, and I'm sure you'll do well with your time in the commission, but please, I hope you will look at these because this is such critical issues to the foundation of, of the land trust. We can talk about our Chamorro roots and our desire and our connection to the land and to our spirits and our history. But if we don't practice it, if we don't set that example, if we don't respect ourselves and each other and what we've been given, uh, then what does that say about us? What does that say about us as a people? And I, again, I can't make, you know, start to make generalizations because sometimes it's the few that unfortunately make everybody look bad. And I, I just like to see things get in order. I don't think there's any reason why they cannot, but I think it takes a lot of you know, guts and fortitude to step up and be counted. And, and I think we're, we need to have 
members of the commission that are willing to do that and start holding people responsible if they if they abuse the opportunities that have been provided to them. So, I mean, I, I'm very strong about that. I don't know. It's just my lived on Guam most of my life. I appreciate my Chamorro history uh, and I love Guam. But like I said, I, I really hate to see the continued uh, abuse of these resources that we've been entrusted with. So with that, Mr. Arreo, thank you very much. You certainly have my support uh, in your nomination. I wish you well, and I hope, uh, I hope we get to see and hear uh, your influence in this process to improve the implementation of the Chamorro Land Trust programs. With that, Madam Chair, thank you for the opportunity to ask Mr. Herrero these questions. Thank you, Senator. Thank you very much, Senator. I'm always grateful for these senators, especially these two, because we will have a very thorough understanding of the nominee. Uh, Director Camacho, I see that you are here. Did you want to testify? Sure, thank you, Speaker. Um, I just uh, would like to say that um, I, I'm looking forward to working with um, Mr. Herrera. If, the legislature decides to confirm him. I did speak with him uh, yesterday and he's uh, obviously very knowledgeable and um, we just, I look forward to, to working with him. Thank you very much and thanks for being with us today. Thank you, and, Chief Speaker. Um, I'd like to uh, again, thank uh, the chairperson, Mr. Regis for uh, his testimony outlining, of course, the importance of the, the plan that the Chamorro Land Trust is coming up with and implementing that plan. And I think if we do that, we are going to pretty much answer all of Senator Brown's concerns, right? Because it does include uh, necessarily uh, more thorough procedures, review of those procedures, the personnel, and also the enforcement itself, right? Of, of the leases and the requirements right, yes. of those leases. Yes, so Sito so, Smasi for your work on that and uh, for your testimony today, Sito Smasi. And Mayor, I want to thank you for your testimony because I think it's very important, uh, you know, your perspective as a mayor, first of all, the Chamorro Land Trust directly involves the, the people, the residences, uh, residents of these villages and uh, their ability to access these lands, I know is a num very high concern for all of the mayors. It's, uh, it's very clear over the years that we've had to deal with these things. It's the mayors who deal with the border disputes, the mayors who are going to deal with the lack of power, water, you know, sewer, the mayors who are going to deal with the illegal dumping a lot of times, a lot of the times and the lack of enforcement by the Chamorro Land Trust. So I want to thank you. And I want to thank you because of course, uh, knowing the nominee uh, being from Hoggett and, uh, and uh, the, the knowledge that he possesses that you've cited, uh, I. I'm very grateful for your testimony. This is Masi Mayor for your time today. This is and, Masi, and, and you know what? We learned a thing or two, if I just may add, from you know, sure. from Senator Brown and, and Senator uh, Tidegui. Thank you so much for asking those questions. And and it is, uh, Speaker, you hit it right on. You know, it's it's going to hit us. Uh, we have so much more tomorrow land trust properties that are are going to be given out down here in our municipality and. And it's our hope, like Senator Brown said, that you know these these individuals that that are given do what they're supposed to do with these properties and take care of them. And we see a lot of abuse, and so uh, you know we really hope that they, you know, the the commission puts the puts the fire right to to these these recipients that that uh, really take responsibility of the properties that you're given and 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 know that you know it's such a that's a God-given gift, you know, to have a piece of property that you don't have to pay for and, and you're just going to take care of it to raise your family. And so thank you so much for the opportunity and, and for the additional knowledge that I gained today. Great. Thank you, Mayor. And Director Birch, I want to thank you as well, because as the nominee pointed out, it's very important, this, this cooperation between the Guam Ancestral Lands Commission and the Chamorro Land Trust Commission they're uh, the impetus of both commissions are very similar, right? They both stem from land takings, unjust land takings. They both stem from an effort of people before us to remedy that injustice, to make sure that uh, we can unite tomorrow's people of Guam with their land, to allow them to be self-sustaining, to allow them to thrive. Right, and so yes. your your genealogy research and your land research, of course, is going to be very instrumental 
uh, based on that new settlement that we've entered into going forward for the Chamorro Land Trust purposes. Yes, thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, and and to the nominee, I I, I don't normally uh, get like this in hearings, but I just want to tell you I am so grateful to hear um, all the effort that you've put into this because. Um, I think it's so important. It's really important to my heart as well. And I know that I don't have, you know, you, you were before me. And so I'm, I'm so grateful that you took the time, despite all of your knowledge, despite all of your experience, and despite uh, pretty much, you know, being there from day one, that you've actually taken the time to listen to all the confirmation hearings, to listen to all the oversight hearings, which I tried to really for some important issues into those. So I'm so grateful that you have picked up on those as well and that you are going to see to it that those things, those are concerns, those are potential abuses again, right? That we want to remedy and that um, of course we want to be more efficient. And so I, I just wanna say, you know, I think um, I was so grateful, you know, that Congressman Underwood also testified, Selva Balta's testimony, both of these and, and Jose, uh, Garrido, all three of them really brought home, you know, the point that um, I think you are the same man who was willing back then to, you know, do what was not done back then. You know, people did not walk the streets and educate each other, right, and use uh, flyers and, and protests and, and camp out, for goodness sake, right, for for principles like this. And so I really want to thank you for your work over all these years. I am honored actually to be holding a hearing for you. Um, and I don't even really know you. And I'm, and, but I just want to say that you did the work for us. You know, we are here because of the work that you've done. The Chamorro Land Trust survives today because of the work that you've done. It was revived back then because of the work that you did. And I'm honored to, to, be part of your confirmation. And uh, and I am here, my committee is here, and I'm sure the senators are here to help you. And so your best recommendations, along with the chairman and all the work that he's been doing, I want I want you guys to know, and the director, thank you again. Uh, you know, you have my support and, and let's get this done. And I'm, you know, for example, our senatorial term is only one year longer, so whatever we can do in this last year, let's get it done. And I really appreciate your willingness to step up to the plate, to take leave from your classified job to do this. I'm actually very happy that you're a classified employee because you're not at the will. You know, your employment is not at risk. You don't serve at the will of anyone. You have, you know, earned your right as a government employee, you're protected. And so you can speak your mind and I really hope that you will do that. I, I am really looking for boards and commission members that are willing to do that because it's not easy, but if we don't do that, we're gonna lose an entire generation that will not know where this came from, right? And what we're trying to do with them. So I really wanna thank you. And um, that's um, <laughs> going to conclude our hearing. And uh, so again, Mr. Rasidus Masi, Dr. Luna Sidus Masi. It's now 2.24 p.m. and, and this hearing is adjourned.